I wear glasses and every time it rains, <laughs> my glasses get fogged up and I get stuck on glass. <laughs> but it's fun. It's fun getting stuck. Yeah. Fun. It's fun getting stuck. Think it's dangerous? No. Really? Really. I mean, a guy in our boat doesn't even want him, doesn't even know how to swim. I've seen little kids coming out of this thing. If all they got a life is over, they should make it. Well, I don't wear one that much. You should wear one because it's a lot safer. I didn't wear one last part because my knees were hurting real bad and I had to put it under my knees. Never fall out. Did you know a lot of, about it before you tried it? No. He's, he's going sailing. Moving water has an awesome force, swift, deceptive. This paddler turned that force against himself by actions which seemed instinctive. Let's take another look. Everyone capsizes, it's part of the sport, but it's what the paddler does in the water that leads to trouble. Instinctively, he tries to stand in the fast current and his foot becomes trapped under a rock. Instinct can be wrong. The river's energy is deceptive. It flows beneath the surface, out of sight, out of mind, working the bottom, transporting the load. But the energy is always there, and the river runner must never forget it. His game is avoiding confrontation, and that takes more than instinct. It takes knowledge of the river, preparation, and skill. No question pops up more on a river trip than what's around the bend. And so it should, because water and rocks team up for some extraordinary effects. A hole and, and a hydraulic are, are both cases where you have a lot of water coming over a ledge or a rock, dropping down. The force of the, the water coming down over that rock makes a depression in the surface below, uh, so you actually do get a hole and the surface water comes back upstream to fill that hole in. So that you, you have water coming down, making a depression, and then surface water coming back up to fill it in. And a person or, or a boat or a raft can get caught in that depression and not be able to get out easily. Rafts are, are particularly dangerous, I think, in holes. You think of them as, as big and stable, uh, but once it's in the hole, it's probably more dangerous than a canoe or a kayak because it's so big that if you, you wash out, fall out of the boat, or it flips, you have to come up underneath. That raft's caught in there, and if you come up under the floor, you can't get a breath. The, uh, the hole, the water doesn't really hold you under. It keeps bringing you back up, but then pushes you under again, so you get circulated around and around in it, and if you're careful, you can get a breath every time you come up. But if the raft is in the hole with you, you may come up underneath and not be able to get that breath of air that can make the difference. So you might, might be really stuck under it. Particular danger in a, in a dam or many artificial uh, obstructions in the river is that they're uniform and even all the way across the river. So there's no point at which there's a downstream current going on through the uh, hole. There's a uniform, even backwash that uh, doesn't give you a spot to get out.
If the tire hadn't been in there, I really don't think we would have lived. That was just pure luck. Maybe the grace of God that it had been floating around in there for days too. We would have been sucked right under. The boats before us, like about three of them, had gone over the damn fine and we were the last boat. And as we went over it, I just remember turning completely upside down and all of a sudden I was just in the water and struggling to get out of the boat. And I was reaching for the boat, but the boat wasn't there. It was slipping away. It was getting pulled away. And we were getting pulled further and further, you know, under the water and up, up closer to where it comes over. And we were lucky we got out because the boat never made it. The boat just broke up in pieces. You often don't realize how strong that current is unless something stops you so that you get the full force of the current against you. But it just has an incredible power then. Flow varies greatly during the year, and in narrow sections of a river, the water can rise many feet above normal. As a result, the river ends up carrying more than just water. Lodge debris is a serious concern for river runners because its occurrence is so unpredictable. At higher water with swift current, a spot like this becomes a real hazard. Uh, the water picked up all kinds of debris along the bank, logs, tree limbs, uh, and they wash down the river and tend to get caught in restricted places where you have rocks that come close together, narrow passage, cracks. The, you get a lot of this debris catching and, and forming strainers and it can be very hazardous to a boater or particularly to a swimmer, someone's in the water. Uh, more so than the rocks because the rocks make a cushion as the current comes along to a rock the rock is solid and diverts the water so that it will push the person or the boat on around most of the times but uh, where you've got logs and limbs caught between rocks the water can go on through but there sometimes isn't room for a boat to get through so the uh, power of the water can hold that boater or person against the trees and the force is just hard to imagine unless you've been caught there. It, uh, it can hold a person there so that they're just helpless, can't, can not even move an arm or a leg just because of the force of the water holding them that way. Be sure that you know what's around the bend because I've come down just below here on this river and uh, a section we'd run hundreds of times came around one day and there was a log completely across the river there, no way of getting through. And if we hadn't seen it in time to stop in an eddy, the raft would have been pinned underneath it probably, and, and I don't know what would have happened. But you want to always be sure you've got a stopping place. You can see far enough ahead uh, to have a clear path or a place to stop and scout from. Logs, holes, waterfalls. They're no problem for the boater who can recognize them early. But there is another more insidious danger that is invisible yet it surrounds and overwhelms as surely as the biggest hole. The tragic scenario of cold water and ill-prepared boaters is played out again and again on our rivers. The day is 80 degrees and yet the water is 30 degrees. I knew we had a disaster. I knew everybody was over when I was in the water. I just knew it. We just weren't prepared for the cold. The tremendous toll that the cold water took on our bodies I finally got out of the water, and I think it was in water up to my knees, and I didn't think I was going to make it. At that point, uh, my legs had lost all their strength. Uh, I got out on the shore and really collapsed. Two of the people didn't make it. Uh, neither of those people were wearing life jackets. They were both hanging on to the boat for a short peri period of time. Uh, he let go, and he was seen going down the river, rolling over and over. Uh, and a life preserver following him. They were the best swimmers in the group, and yet the swimming strength really didn't mean a thing. The body wasn't recovered, I think, for, oh, four months down the Connecticut River. Equipment is an integral part of whitewater sport. It allows for that margin of error which all boaters need from time to time when their judgment is amiss. Beyond such crucial items as a life jacket, throw rope, first aid kit, and flotation, the river will suggest what equipment to bring. Is the river cold? Is it shallow and rocky? Is it remote and inaccessible? The boater should choose his equipment to match the conditions of the river.
While the right gear can go a long way toward providing a safe trip, ultimately the group needs something else. Something that each person should have in his head before he ever puts on the river. We should probably scout this next one. It's a sense of the river, a sense of moving water, the surprises, the power, the potential. With knowledge of the river and the right equipment, a paddler is off to a good beginning, but he needs one more not-so-small item called skill. Skill enables the body to do what is in the mind. It translates that sense of water into emotion. There you go! Emotion which must be learned step by step. Cock your paddle there. Really cock your wrists over. Okay. And I want you to go over. Wait a second until you feel that your hands are up above the water. Okay, you'll feel the, feel the air on them. Mm -hmm. And then I'll grab your paddle and I'll position you out. I'll sweep it out and then you just snap your hips, okay? Teaching the body to perform is a necessary aspect of whitewater sport. Frustrating as the learning process may be, it is far easier with the aid of experienced teachers and away from the urgency of swift current. Real whitewater is a poor training ground for basic skills that could be learned on a lake. Okay, over. Paddle correct? Mm-hmm. That's good. All right, you brought your head up a little It's a simple fact. The paddler who has learned to get the most from himself and his craft has more options when problems arise. And as his skill develops, so does the intensity of the water he can safely handle. But his aim remains constant. On moving water, the boater strives for harmony, not confrontation. Knowledge and skill are his tools. He strives to sense the water, to discover a logic in its chaos, to draw from its energy, to make the power his own.